Hi Lenny, thanks a million for joining us. Pleasure, Con. Nice to be here. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. I hope you're, as we said, surviving lockdown. Uh, you seem yeah. to be looking on Twitter. You seem to be acquiring dogs. Yeah, we acquired a third dog in the last um, three weeks. Who then? She's fantastic, like rescue dog, two years old, but she just went into heat. Oh my goodness! So we're so that the, it's complete madness. I can't even tell you what's going on. It's an education. <laughs> As if, as if lockdown wasn't tricky enough already. Exactly, exactly. Well, congrats. You must be uh, delighted about the Golden Globe nominations. Yeah, it was brilliant, actually, because um, particularly that... Uh, the, the, I mean, I was delighted for Daisy. Um, and it's unfortunate with that Paul didn't as well. It seems to be either one or the other, like the Emmys was Paul and not Daisy. Um, yeah. But to get the series nomination was... Or the series nomination was brilliant because it's only five... And obviously, there's just everything is competing against us. So it was lovely to get that just for everybody else. That's fantastic. Yeah, there's some serious competition all the time at the moment. I guess. Yeah. Quality, I think. Um, well, listen, thanks a million. So the the idea of this seminar that we're doing is is um, just getting people in who, who work in different roles in in media and and to talk about the kind of the, the nuts and bolts and the details of of what they do and you know and talk to their career a little bit but um, yeah. i was just thinking so we you we were talking four years ago uh in wow. 16 when you were down in Galway, and it was on the we, at the time we were talking about how at the time we thought that was a terrible year for humanity but you had yeah. had great personal success uh it, it must be a little odd then uh, this year being like having this this um you know, being the, one of the cultural highlights of a, of a global pandemic. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was thinking if, 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 if people are hoping for a sort of a really good run of, uh, you know, of, of years, they should just shoot me in the head. <laughs> it's, it's all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, yeah, it's true because 16 was Trump and we, room had just come out and now it's this. Yeah, it was, it, I mean, it, it was interesting kind of for us because we only finished normal people. We actually finished it with, you know, in the first weeks of the pandemic when, I, when we were in lockdown. So even a few weeks difference and we would not have finished. Um, we had bits that we had to do, like getting actors into studios to do final bits of ADR um, things that you couldn't do from home. And then the last bits that we had to do, not ideally, but we were able to do it from home. Um, and 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 deliver the show with you know a week or two to spare. I, yeah, so so it was it was a, it was a hairy time, and it would have been a completely different lockdown experience for for us and for me. You know, we had the excitement of all of that stuff happening and doing lots of press. So the first, I think, really three months, two two and a half months of all that stuff, March and April and May, that was entirely taken up with doing doing this but for press. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It must have been an odd experience having that, all that public success in such a kind of private and isolated time. It, amazing. And I mean, I think for the actors, it was even more uh, unusual an experience. If you think about Paul and Daisy, you know, Paul was in a flat, he just moved to London. He was in a flat in London. Um, and he went from sort of nobody having a clue who he was to paparazzi outside his house. Um, and Daisy as well was, I think, in a flat. And then they were just in this virtual, having this virtual experience of turning into big stars. Uh, yeah. You know, really incredible. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it is amazing. It's, it's, it was you and Michael Jordan, I think, were the, the uh, first lockdown um, experiences for lots of people. We were, we we're very similar, obviously, yeah. in lots of ways. <laughs> Um, did you, I mean, do you have a sense when you're working on a project, uh, maybe, you, maybe you always have this sense, this, this could be a good one, this is, you know. I mean, you know, I think you do sometimes and it differs, you know, you do them for different reasons and, you know, you know, they're not all going to have a kind of broad appeal. Um, but you always you always have a kind of sense well there are possibilities you can't kind of um rule out and try not to think about that too much but i think on this one 
I knew, like we all knew that the, you know, Sally's book was a big deal. So that obviously means that a certain kind of attention is going to be focused on the, the adaptation. Um, and then Daisy and Paul were like manifestly amazing from when we cast them and, and shooting it. And then I, I, like Nathan would be editing as we go and you're looking at edits and scenes and, and, and you kind of feel there's something there. But I think my sense of, of normal people was that it, would, it was going to be a really good piece of work that the people who love the book would pay attention to it. But I think my, my, my sense was that in a very fast um, moving kind of television world where first of all, there's so much stuff there, you know, the turnover is really quick and the, you know, the kind of the PR industry is always moving on very fast. And also within the work itself, the, the pace of, of storytelling tends to be much faster and 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 we were we were like ours was a kind of concentrated experience. We thought like you'd need to spend some time with it. And if you were looking for a kind of an immediate hit, a kind of sugary high, um, you just wouldn't get it. So I I thought that the moment I really would I I really thought that the moment for shows or for stories which were told in that kind of very low key way was difficult. You know. Um, so I, I, I thought what would happen was we'd have a dedicated core of people who thought it was very good and the critics might like it. Um, but then it would be sort of like one of those things which happens to me and everybody who makes stuff all the time where you go, you eventually have that kind of download conversation with the distributor where they go, well, yeah, it's been, you know, it's, it, it got a good attention and the numbers have been a bit soft. They have all these adjectives that are like, <laughs> <laughs> try and, you know, bit soft, like, you know, we, we think it, it's difficult for people to kind of tune into that stuff because it's a little bit more maybe art house than they're used to. So that honestly is what I was expecting. And then none of us had any idea that would be a sort of massive success in that weird way that it was. Yeah, yeah. I was watching you call my agent last night and uh, there's a filmmaker on that and he's saying, tell me what your what my, tell me really what you think of my film and please don't use the words courageous or unique. So, uh, you know. <laughs> You hear yeah, there's a lot of that. <laughs> um, and you know, there's a lot of distributors will say, you know, oh, like we're so proud of it, and you know, we think we've loved every minute of it. And you think it's like it, it is the kind of thing you say uh, of a noble failure. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I do want to talk some more about normal people, but I'd love to take you back a little bit, actually, to the time when we we last talked because. We get a lot of people, we talk like the students hear from a lot of people who are talking to them about, you know, the first stages of their career and how do you, you know, how do you take those first steps into the industry? But I'm really interested to hear about, you know, what happens when you have success, like a really, you know, like a really measurable success, like the Oscar nomination. Yeah. You. I, you know, I was thinking about, you know, the way sometimes you hear sports people like golfers talking about, I have to reassess my, my goals. Like, do, does it make you think about what you're doing and what you want to do differently? Or do you just think oh, it's the opportunity to do more of what I wanted to do? I think it does. Like, you know, it definitely, it, it's, it's, it's a process for a start. So that like the initial kind of experience of, of the success is, is, is just kind of nice and, you know, uh, or exhausting or whatever, depending on your personality, you, you know, there are times where you don't like the attention or you do, that's all fine. But I think it takes a while to kind of settle into what it means. Um, and it's really, I can see it now more clearly than I could see it then or even in the year that followed. Um, so the, the openings that it makes and the possibilities that it gives you, and they are really concrete, you know. But with that comes a kind of series of questions because you don't, it's only when you have the freedom that it gives you, you know, freedom in terms of, you know, you can get projects made and you can, you know, not quite do what you want, but in certain, within certain bands of kind of budget and you can do what you want, which is a really odd experience for a filmmaker because you spend the bulk of your time trying to get things done that nobody wants you to do. You know, it's like just, it's, it's con you know, it's that knocking on doors and pitching and, and trying to persuade people. And then when that gets turned around, I think there is a kind of, you could experience a kind of paralysis of choice where mm. 
Um, what do I really want? What do I, it's a very difficult question to answer. And also, I think you discover what you want by the decisions that you make. It's a bit like that old joke, how do I know what I think until I've said it. It's only when you're offered things which you would have previously said, oh, that's not my sort of thing. It's a bit commercial or whatever. Well, you only know if you really mean that when you are offered that and you can either say yes or no. And so far I have um, not, I have said no. Um, and what I go through this process every time and I'm beginning to, I hope this isn't too long winded, but it's interesting because just in the last few days I've been thinking about this. Um, I'm beginning to recognize the pattern, which is if something sort of juicy comes to me, um, especially if it's really good and there are really good things out there not a hell of a lot of them, but some of them are, there are some of them. And I read it and I go, or I read the, 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 the sort of idea or, you know, or, I, or the script I read it or if it's a play or a book. Um, and I go, I have to take this, my, the process is I, I think, I can't just say no to this, it's really good. And, and then I take two weeks where I read it, I think about it, I ask for a bit of time to think about it, and then I eventually pass on it. And what I've realized is I think I'm going to have to say now and to, to, to my agent really, to my age, you know, to say, look, I'm actually not available for reading stuff because just the time it takes to go through the process, which I sort of now know I'm not going to say yes. Um, and concentrate, which I've always really done on the stuff that I've been developing myself and with Ed and with Element. And it's also about a certain belief realization that if I, if I don't prioritize my own writing and my own kind of authored stuff, and I think I do end up authoring the things that I do, but I sort of slide sideways into that. And I'm keen now to do that more directly. Um, and then the question is, what would, the, what would have happened if I hadn't had that success? I pro there's every argument, there's every sort of reason to believe that I would have found ways to author my stuff more directly you know because you just you, you don't have that sort of range of possibilities mm. um and you I t I t sorry to ramble but it's kind of interesting because it's alive for me at the moment this question um one of the things that i've recognized and i don't think there's any way out of this things have even i i occasionally have an idea and i go god that could be interesting but I can see that it's a really like small target to make it good. Like, you know, you're shooting, it's a really difficult idea or, um, or, or it would demand a huge investigation. And I just know that I don't have the bandwidth because I'm servicing the projects that I'm already doing. And sure. I think if I was in my own place and nobody was paying me any attention, I might be more inclined to go down those very, um, odd paths and maybe end up with something really good but when you have a lot of choice and you have sort of the it's it's available it's really really hard to keep doing that you know and you end up I know I end up not doing lots of things that would be interesting because I don't know those the, the choices are too too many I mean it strikes me. I'm just thinking personally. I, I would imagine I'd have a lot, a lot of long dark nights to the soul, thinking, "Oh my God, what did I, what, what did I turn down?" Oh um, yeah. I, I mean, I just you know, I have you have to get used to this idea. So before, I know I'm turning down things that people would absolutely chew your arm off for, and that I would have cho chewed your arm off for 15 years ago. Um, but what I the good thing is. And I, I actually had this conversation with Ed yesterday. I, so before, you know, you read something and you go, is this really extraordinary? Will it make an amazing film? Will people want to watch it? And of course, if the answers to all those are yes, of course you're going to say yes. But now I, I, the, the, the final question is, is it about me? Do I feel myself in it? Um, and if I don't, then I have to get used to the fact and be quicker at and less spend less time going thank you that's amazing i'd love to see that but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna throw my hat in the ring and what sort of things make you think yeah this is this is about me this is um there are there are car like increasingly it's about sort of um 
like a, a desire to to do things that are that really stretch my understanding of the medium a bit, mm-hmm. and that and that aren't repeating the things I know I'm able to do. That's difficult because I don't know. I don't like to feel that I'm doing something again. And on the other hand, you are developing a way of working in a language over a career, and and part of that's a positive thing. So that's a difficult balance. And um, and then the other thing is, I suppose. Is it about those aspects of character or those hard to reach ideas, um, which which is which can only be got if you marry the form and the tone and the themes in a really sort of sophisticated way? And and there are sort of territories that I'm really interested in. I'm really interested in characters always who have uh, deep misconceptions about themselves or struggle to to find, to make sense of themselves. And, and I want to broaden that out into a kind of, like, I'd love to find a way or to develop kind of work where that kind of, that discussion at the level of the character is also broadened out into a kind of societal um, conversation about what are, what are the ways in which we live that kind of create that atomized or that self, um, alienated person um so you know and my love has always been ultimately of i think i am quite kind of promiscuous in my interests you know but but ultimately deep down it's for a kind of european cinema or an ideal of your of a european cinema which is intellectually serious you know and and i think if i'm go, if i'm going to really explore things in that then i have to kind of be a bit, bit more of a be a bit more ascetic, if you know what I mean. Sure. And, and and the difficulty is if you if you've had success, and it's happened to me twice now, and that's like even more intense because people think it's definitely not a flash in the pan, and you end up, you know, at the moment, like, and this is just an uh, observable sort of fact rather than me blowing my own trumpet. I know I'm on all the lists uh, for the sort of really good projects. Not, not you know, nobody's looking at action movies and thinking let's give it to Lenny. But, but sure. if it's a, if, if it's a, if it's a really interesting character piece, then I know I'm probably one of the people that it's going to come to. And, you know, some of that stuff is amazing. I read something in the last few days where, and he, you know, and I, Monica, my wife, read it and said you should have to do that. And I, I sort of felt like I can totally see why I would, you know. I would have killed to do this. It's just a, it's a brilliantly observed piece about American culture now, and it's got great parts in it and it will win awards. But I, but I thought, well, yeah, but it's already there. And it does, I'm not going to do a substantially different, I mean, I, I'll do, I would do something interesting with it, but I'm not going to do something unique to me that another director couldn't do. So I, I felt like, well, that would be two years, two years where I wasn't exploring the sort of things that I was just talking to you about. Sure. So, I mean, from you talking there, you, you obviously have a very strong sense of yourself as as an artist, as you know what what you what your work is, is about. Obviously, that must be something that develops over time. I mean, you don't arrive on your first day in the film set and go, "This is who I am." No, I'm actually. It is a sort of discovery because you can't really invent yourself much as we try and, and, and part of, I think, the early experience of anybody who does something creative is the trying on of different kind of personas or of, you know, you, you take on the characteristics of, of, of artists that you pre- really appreciate. Yeah. And, and, you, and, and, and most of the thing then is just really sort of a process of discovering what rings true to you um, and I don't think I've really fully done it. You know, I genuinely mean that. I think that 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 part of my kind of decision around this these this kind of four or five year period of of success has been what do I do with the kind of capital that I've built up in the industry? Do I use it to make myself massively successful and extremely wealthy not that that would be a guarantee you know but you could have a good I could certainly have a good crack at it (laughs) um or or do I use it to um 
buy myself the freedom and the time to back myself as a as an artist you know and, and maybe speak to fewer people and that's okay sure. you know it's not an absolute distinction right. because uh, you know i will still do television work of a really high end which is which does reach a big audience but it's really prioritizing some film ideas which are a bit more um challenging you know formally challenging because you could make you know you can make a big splash with work which is it's really uh, you know it's really realizing that the big splash thing is not the end and not the purpose sure you know just picking up a little bit there on that you know talking about film and television i mean could you talk a little bit about the difference of working in those mediums and you know how you approach how how a project is conceived and, and how it unfolds over time yeah there I think that there used to be a kind of a a difference which was a very obvious difference of uh you know in one sense quality mm. like from a directorial point of view particularly um like there's often been really great writing in television um but but it it tends to you know it tends to be the writing and up until recently it has tended to be the writing that's been you know that's where the variation is coming and 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 i think because of the structure of uh, of the way stuff was made for television when it was made for national big national broadcasters had to be broader had to appeal to a big national audience and the restrictions on kind of i don't know even you know uh difficult content was much more onerous in in television that's really gone so what you're left with now so, so it's possible to make you know to and film directors are and television directors are interchangeable now that it, it, it you know everybody does both or most people do both um and so i don't i'm not conscious when i'm working in television of of like um you know dumbing myself down in any way or working in a different way with actors or anything i think where the differences are now are really kind of the proper differences you know the ones that are based on form yeah so the episodic quality of television um you know, unless you're making TV movies, but the, the 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 sort of what we're talking about, which is series television, it it's different, you know. And I I and also, and so you you approach it differently in that way. You know, you approach differently how story flows and and how you where you leave people at the ends of these sections, and and so it's a different type type of conversation you're having with somebody. It's over a longer period of time. Um, I think there is still perhaps that difference where within the band of you know right up to the kind of what you might call the conventional art house space you know um right up to what you see in most festivals there i think um television and film can can operate in that space i think there is a level of of difficulty and of kind of purity that still really is reserved for the cinema and that's because the cinema really, um, in a really basic and sort of practical, you know, sense, provides you with an audience, a level of audience attention, particularly at the beginning, which is more, which is more robust. You know, in a really basic way, you can just press the remote control when you're watching TV. So unless people are told that this is really important and they're, and they're sort of in, in a way helped to give it attention of a certain kind there is a kind of consumer quality sometimes that will will stop but so if you want to make really um pure work which is very you know particularly challenging i think still cinema has an edge um but yeah you know and so I, in other words i don't think if if if, if another angelopoulos came along they won't be working in tv or you know, they'd still be working in the cinema. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me increasingly when I watch, because of what, you know, like everyone who watched so much long form television, the, 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 experience, the movie experience increasingly, I'm seeing as analogous to the short story, that concentrated, yeah. intense moment. Because, yeah. you know, we're so used to the idea of world building, that the yeah. idea of a moment in space and time that you, you go into and you, uh, absolutely. I mean, 
one thing we were trying to do with normal people was just, and I think it might have happened a couple of times in the course of the whole show, is just create uh, something in television that, like within each of those short episodes, you might have the feeling of a kind of a singular thing, you know, and occasionally those moments, which which you hope are kind of poetic or short story like in that way, that turn or that 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 kind of that sense of things falling away that you get in a good short story. But you're right, cinema is where you can still make the poem or the um, the pure single experience. Yeah, I mean, you know, in a very practical sense, in terms of what you're talking about about the you know, just the power of people to, to turn off the, the TV. When you're making, when you were making normal people, was there any pressure from, in terms of the funders, in terms of how you put that together? Well, it's interesting because, so you couldn't have got better people, you know, the execs were like absolutely top. And um, so, so like, you know, for example, no issues about accent, no issues about um, vocabulary that might not play in America. You can imagine, the conversation you might have had with the you know the cliched version of the american executive about like about normal people and none of that happened the only place there was any pressure and it was from the states rather than the bbc mostly but maybe a tiny bit from the bbc was around the beginning of episode one for exactly that reason so and they, it was really civilized and in the end they said it's up to you guys you know we're not going to dictate this um but there was a pre there was pressure to get more quickly to the kind of juiciness, you know. Basically, right. let's get this love story up and running um, within the first. Like, let's try and or even tell people at the very very beginning where it's going to go, and then flash back and start from you know. But, sure. but because the fear is, it's just quite like low key at the mm -hmm. beginning, and it takes a while, and and. You know, the, my process whenever I end up in a discussion like that is to say, I don't, you know, to argue what I think is true, but say, look, I'm going to show you a bunch of things. I, I'm never like, I won't touch it because if you do that, you just end up, it all gets, it all gets escalated. And um, I find that the way to get what you want is to just listen to people, have them recognize that you're taking them seriously, show them what they are asking for, and then say why you think it doesn't work, you know, or maybe you discover aspects of it do work. You know? sure. um, but my argument in the end was, was just, look, if we, uh, if we sort of glossify the first five minutes of normal people, then you are, you're starting, I mean, in a really crap analogy, you're starting dinner with dessert and you're, <laughs> you're always going to be craving that. Mm. Um, the, the reason why you're all saying it gets so unbelievably good, can we not start there, is the reason why it feels unbelievably good is that we start where we start and you believe you're in a real place and you believe these are real people. And you lose all that if you try and, you know, sure. jump in. In a different kind of show, you can do that, you know. Uh, so, so they bought that in the end. And, but it is also the reason why I felt, I thought to myself, well, they are kind of right. We will lose audience. But there's no, we, you know, we just have to let them go because if we try and hold that audience, we'll do so at the expense of the quality of the show. I actually, you, you, I mean, you talked already about the fact that there was an audience there in terms of fans of the book. And, uh, you know, a lot of, since, since your early films with uh, Mark, a lot, a lot of your films and, and TV work has been adaptation. Yeah. I mean, is pressure there in terms of fidelity or... You know, I don't feel the pressure. My pressure about adaptations is more internal, which is that I don't want to keep doing them. Um, and it's part, part, partly the thing is, again, if you have success with an adaptation, um, what Richard did was not really an adaptation in the sense, if you read the book, it's such a departure. It was a really yeah. great starting point. And then we use that to kind of work with actors and develop a script around one of the characters in the novel. So the first real adaptation was, was Room. And because that was such a success, I then become, I'm in the privileged position of lots of pre-published books, which are amazing. I get to look at them and, and then you go, God, you know, so, so do the little stranger I had always wanted to do. Yeah. Um, but, but normal people, when Ed said, read normal people, 
I was not reading books for adaptation at that point. I thought I, I, I was concentrating on some projects which are not based on anything. And, but of course I loved it, you know, and it was just too, too, too interesting a thing. I thought, God, to do really good intimacy, like really, really truthful intimacy on screen for a big audience is such a, a brilliant thing to do. And because of that, and because I enjoyed it so much, I, I really felt I had to do conversations as well. Yeah. So then I find myself sort of Mr. Adaptation for a while. And that's the pressure for me is more like resisting the temptation to do more adaptations. Um, I think with Room, I was more aware of the fact that this was a really beloved book and I was much, I was more of a rookie in terms of other people's eyes. And so I was aware that there'd be a lot of attention. I think with normal people, I had a good sense of that book right from the beginning, got on really well with Sally. She was part of the thing as Emma was with Room. And so I thought we had a pretty solid like foundation in the novel. I wasn't too worried about people. I thought maybe people will say, oh, that's not how I imagined it. Um, but actually uh, I, that wouldn't have massively bothered me. I, I think if you read normal people, you think who would adapt this? I think your name would probably be one of the first people to come up, you know. The styles do certainly, I think. They fit, they yeah. really do. Sally does this thing of, of, of appearing to, appearing to not do much, you know, and, and she talks about what people say and what they do and she observes things about them and talks about what they think. It doesn't read as a hyper literary um, style at all. And yet she manages to, to create a sense of depth. And I'm, there is an analogy to the way I work, which is that it, I try to make it seem not quite naive, but just like you're there with the people, you know, and you're not really aware of the filmmaking. Um, and that, and yet you find yourself kind of a, a arriving at somewhere that feels kind of truthful and deep. Absolutely. And I, I, like I find sometimes, like looking back, whether at a, you know, at a scene or, or at a page like that, and going, how did that just happen? How did that just do that to me? Like I'm almost trying to reverse engineer. Yes. Yeah, I've always loved work like that where I go that's amazing it is I mean it's a bit like part of the pleasure if you if you step away from the the real experience of watching part of the pleasure is like watching a kind of good close-up magician mm. and you kind of go that I was really watching that closely and I still don't quite know how that happened and and for me whenever that occurs and I think that's a really wonderful feeling like there's a scene in normal people in episode five where Connell apologizes to Marianne for how he treated her in school. And that's, that scene went through loads of iterations on, on, in the script, which I was across. And, and then when I rehearsed it with the actors, we discovered lots of things that would be really interesting and then went back to the writers. And, and, and that, so even before we got to set with that scene, it felt like loads of really good thinking had gone into it. And then on the day, we just simplified and simplified and simplified how it was shot until it really is just what it looks like, you know, a series of, it is a series of static shots of both of them. But everything in it is thought about and, and the emotion is true. And because of that, the scene, I think, becomes something more than that. And yet, there's no trick, you know, it's just like millions of decisions that were made across all of us, writers, director, different departments, and the acting. And, and I think that's a scene I'm proud of because it feels like, um, like there's nothing false in it, you know. There's a, great, um, there's a great article I always get the students to read. It's by a, a film critic called Victor Perkins. And the article is called Moments of Choice. And basically he argues that what a director's role is is just to make lots of tiny decisions but always making those decisions with this bigger canvas yeah. in his or her head, you know, the shape, the structure, the themes. Um, you know, so they, you know, you, the, all the little decisions on, them, on their own seem inconsequential. Absolutely, and if you, if you ever go to a set and you're expecting to see fireworks or like, you know, some kind of diva-like director making incredible inspired choices, you'll be really disappointed because what you'll see is loads of people saying, do you want that there or there or, um, you know, and it's just, it's it's like, it, it's much more sort of, um, like it's much smaller than that in a way. Now you do have moments, you know, they often happen previously or whatever. And, and I, 
I, I think it's a really good analogy because what I learned as well is that you think consciously about the themes and the ideas a lot and about the style a lot and you have conversations and sketch things out and make kind of, you know, run things in your head and everything. But what you're hoping eventually will happen is that you will kind of internalize the project. You learn it so well that you sort of internalize it so that you can make very intuitive decisions very quickly. Because if you have to sort of, it's like being good at anything, you know, if you're good at maths, if you're not great at maths, you go, hang on, what's the rule again? Yeah, I have to do that. that. And you end up sort of like mechanically applying these rules. Whereas a person who's really good at maths just kind of feels the pattern, sees it, has a kind of innate feel for it. And part of the process of filmmaking, and I always emphasize this with filmmakers, is just, it's just the in, in, imperative to work really hard um, because it's only by working really hard and kind of Im imbibing the project, mm. like really, really internalizing it. Then you are sort of, you're, you're riding a bike or something and you just, you're feeling your way through it and those decisions will always be better. This doesn't feel right. Kind of mechanical ones. Yeah, yeah. This feels right or this doesn't feel right. Yeah, and, and actually that's mostly your job on set, you know, is to sit there and, and trust your own gut feelings. And if they if it doesn't feel right and you don't know why, don't be afraid to go, this doesn't feel right. Let's let's take it apart and put it back together again. Um now it's easier when you have a track record because the crew will go, um, even if the crew don't quite get what you're doing they'll go oh that you probably knows what he's talking about you know and that's a virtuous kind of circle because yeah, that yeah. they have confidence in you and you know and all that at the very beginning it's harder to do that because you know the worst thing you want you just don't want to seem like you're indecisive mm -hmm. um but you still have to back that instinct because that's really why you're there you know yeah absolutely um i, I mean i'd imagine that that both possibly sounds terrifying to 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 students wanting to become filmmakers like how do who, how do i get there but equally as you say you you work that you, it's through yeah i mean yourself in it. it's immersing yourself in the project like you can be the person who knows it better than anybody mm -hmm. and and actually if you take a bit of a deep breath once you've done that and and if you expect that you'll have moments on set where you feel a bit panicky or you don't you feel like fuck i, I don't know what i think about this expect that and learn to sort of breathe your way through it and wait till the kind of instincts come back. I mean, it's funny because I'm sh truly shit at this sort of um, approach in the rest of my life, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so, so the funny thing is like, it is weirdly in the pressurized situations of filmmaking where I feel, where I've learned to relax, you know, I'm not the sort of person who can like meditate themselves to sleep or, you know, people are really good at like living in that way. Yeah. But somehow when, when I'm, I'm good under pressure of a particular kind, but you can, you can learn your way to that. Yeah, of course. You know? yeah, yeah. Be, yeah. You do it enough times, it becomes uh, something that you know how to do. Um, exactly. Great. I mean, there's, there's a few questions come in that I'd like to, I'd like to throw to you, but I just wanted Please. to specifically just, just to follow up on that, just a little bit about dealing with actors in particular. Yeah, just, sure. I've got some questions about that. Um, you know, uh, I, I was thinking as well, like if we, if you return to normal people, like and, and obviously room before that, dealing with a younger cast versus, I guess, someone like Charlotte Rampling coming in, I guess, yeah, a couple of days on The Little Strangers. Yeah. How, how do you deal with that differently, or how, just general advice on how to talk to actors? I mean, first thing is, it's not. I used to think that everything that didn't work has to be your fault as the director, you know? So you kind of think that you can construct a perfect performance. And actually it's, it's a collaboration. And, and so, you know, you, so much of it is, is understanding what is being given to you and, and where you can kind of naturally move that. It's like working with the grain of the actor, working with the kind of the way the actor their natural kind of approach and not, and so that is really helpful for start because you realize um, that it's not just you, you know, it, it, there are, you also have that person and that's a good thing. Um, I have learned 
a couple of things. So I can give like a few sort of bits of advice that I think are kind of useful. One is that like actors are not one unified, um, you know, they don't all work the same way. And it's really good to have a sense of what it is that your actor responds to. So sometimes there are actors who are very um, keen to talk about the history of the character. They want to build up a kind of a really developed backstory. And that can be really good for them. And other actors, it is really not helpful. Mm. And what they really want from you is a sense of kind of tone or of, of kind of temperature and, you know, and it's more physical and it's more like, like if you work with comedians often who are, can make some of the best actors, it's, it's often a lot to do with how the actor, how the character moves and sounds and everything. Sure. Um, and, and so it's like listening to that. Um, and generally, this feeds into the other piece of advice, it's just listening generally. You know, I, I would say that I talk much less on set than I would have at the beginning. And you would have thought in a way, maybe, you know, you're sort of shy at the beginning and then you get more and more kind of, um, you know, you take charge more. I mean, I think you have to take charge, but there are different ways of doing it. So rather than um, arriving and anxiously unloading loads of instructions and ideas onto the cast, which I think can be a bit overwhelming because, you know, that, that implies a sort of mechanical process where you just tell them a few things and they sort of slot that into mm. the, the kind of the computer and then out comes the performance. You're better off, I think, just like running the scene in a really, really simple way and seeing what the actors are doing and trusting your own instinct about it. And then in very simple ways, which are appropriate for that actor, just like discussing it with them, asking them what they felt about it, seeing what was suggested by the scene as it played there and finding out whether there are more interesting places to go. I mean, there's no, there's no easy way to sort of start. I think that's the other thing I would say is it's okay to be inexperienced with working with actors. Sure. It's okay to not quite know the language that's best used with, with, with them or that particular actor. And you, if an actor chooses to kind of call you on that inexperience, Nothing you can do about it. You can own it and say, yeah, absolutely. We still have to get this made and it still has to be good. Most actors, however, won't if you have a sense of the project. Sure. Because that's really what you need to have. And if you have that sense of the project, you can, with an actor, go, here's what I would really like to achieve, what I would love it to feel like. Um, let's see if we can, even if, it's, even if it's kind of stumbling and bumbling our way there, that's okay. And I think if you have the confidence to do that, the actor will respond if they're a decent human being, and most of them are. And you do that enough, and you will start to find a way of talking, and you'll learn the bits, you'll learn the way it works best for you, you'll learn the kinds of techniques and, and, and ways of talking that are most helpful. Sure. Um, and I mean, this, this could be the subject of like, the, our, uh, of 10 hours of, because you know, there's so many things to say. What, one thing I would try to get people to think hard about is trying not to be tempted into really direct instructions around emotion. You know, be sadder, be angrier. It much better to find a way of talking about that stuff, which is, I don't know, um, which 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 is doesn't just rely on adjectives like that sure. you know really simple things like you don't want to let this person um you know you you, you don't want to hear what they're saying that's an, that's a direction which is actable on yeah right not be angry with them well in what way you know but if you know that it's like i really don't want to hear this because it's painful or yeah. or or makes me think about myself in a way that I find uncomfortable that's a direction that an actor can really latch on to so it's trying to find things which are active which help which 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 make the actor feel like oh okay that's the style of interaction that we're having in this scene rather than um oh I think you should be more angry or I think you know because that's just very hard to work with sure yeah yeah absolutely yeah no, that's really useful um the, just, I'm just there's 
there's two questions I like to ask everyone before we finish up, but I, I want to sure. just quickly throw out the, uh, just a couple. There's a question here from Pierce. He's wondering, has your approach to screenplays changed over the years? Um, he's talking about how Pavel Pavlovsky has said he'd rather work with a 25 page outline as there's more to discover. Um, I was wondering, that, does that kind of a Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because there are projects that I'm thinking about now where I don't want to write um, the full dialogue, where it is, it's more like that. Um, I might, I've become harder and I've become more kind of, if anything, more obsessed with, you know, with script, you know, every, you know, as the years go by more and more. And my, my, it's, it's another conversation I could go on and on, but my kind of impulse when it comes to script, and I, I'm involved in it right from early on, like that's a big part of the work and making sure that I really believe it. And I feel it's, it, we're avoiding kind of mechanical, you know, scene writing, which is just clearly there to illustrate some aspect of the character that you know you need to illustrate before you move on. Sure. Um, and um, one thing, and this is at odds with how I think scripts are read by people who maybe are gonna fund a film or a television series, but for me, I like very, very pared back and limited scene descriptions. I, I hate parentheticals, you know. Um, I, I don't want the actor to be told what they're feeling. I want it to be a sort of quite a bare document mm -hmm. because that leads the mo leaves the most space for interpretation and discovery. And, and I then still, right up until we're shooting and on the day itself, treat the script as provisional. And if we discover something better in the scene, that's the best. And then you'll change, we'll just change it on the day. And I could never work on something where I had to stay, I had to stick to the script. I mean, you know, if, even when I've done work, which is closer to sort of gun for hire, which is very rarely, I always have to have the capacity to change. I could never imagine, you know, those things where in, in conventional television, it's like, no, no, you don't change a word. I mean, I don't see how you can really be directing if you can't run with what's happening on the day, if it's more interesting. Sure, absolutely. Um, another question, and this kind of goes back to the conversation, uh, the things you just said about, you know, dealing with the, the funders and normal people is about, um, this question is about advice on representing Irish culture without any people who may not be familiar with it. But I, I was actually also just going to bring in the fact we had, um, I was at a seminar with the head of Amazon Europe recently, and she was talking about how increasingly audiences want local content but universal stories yeah i mean it is remarkable how wrong the kind of common wisdom was and for how long it was wrong about that stuff like what other audiences would tolerate it's incredible actually um how the existence of these kind of platforms has re revealed how sort of narrow-minded people were about about what audiences would accept. I mean, I, I think generally speaking, in the same way that politicians are always way less progressive than the populations that they represent, um, you know, film companies and television companies were absolutely massively underestimated their audiences. Um, so it is true that that really specific is much more interesting to people. Um, and and you know, we could not, like, it's so fascinating. Think about normal people, right? It could never have been made. This couldn't have been, let's say 20 years ago, it would have to have been made for RTE or like BBC at a push, but RTE really. Who, and they wouldn't have made it because for millions of reasons, culturally and what was acceptable and what was taboo and everything. But nobody would have thought that a small, you could make a story about a, uh, two characters from a small town in Sligo who have an on-again, off-again relationship with each other in which nothing hugely dramatic happens and where the dialogue and the kind of cultural references are absolutely specific. Like the idea of that being a sort of global hit, I mean, it was just amazing to me to see, you know, people in, you know, various states in America talking about the show and think nobody knew that 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 human beings were well 
lost it but like in the official sort of you know the people who ran ran the show in the old days nobody believed that that would be possible so i would really say to people um there is a way i mean it's not to say that every small kitchen sink drama like no like that can be just as generic in other words you can make sure. small town irish stories which are actually won't travel because they really are just the kind of rehashing of of a different you know of a sort of stereotype kind of artistically respectable stereotypes you know lonely farmers and sure. and all that stuff it has to be special it has to be really good we, but we it won't mention any upcoming must... Netflix releases. Uh, What's that? I said we won't mention any upcoming Netflix uh, film it, releases. On... Yes, indeed, indeed. <laughs> um, dying to see that, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So I think you can make, you know, um, you, you. But it has to be a real world. It 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 can't be just your your local, sure. uh, your national version of of kind of truth. It has to be a real thing. Right. No, I think that's yeah, really important. And it's it's nice to hear that. Hopefully, the you know the funders are are are, are uh, understanding that now. I mean, listen. You know, there was a thing um, recently. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it was that kind of. It went viral. That that British. Um, it was a parish council meeting. Yes. yes. Now, unbelievably British. Like just the, every every type was in there. And you think to yourself, like, if that, if you were from that world and you decided to make an incredibly observant comedy about a parish council, that could be, uh, that could be global. Um, you know, but if you were going to make sort of um, a broader sitcom about that stuff, it wouldn't travel as sure. well. You know, it's interesting. Um, but so, as I said, there's just a couple of quick. Thanks so much for your sure. time. And I, I Not at all. There's a couple of quick questions I'd like to ask everyone, um, both of which you may not may not have an answer. But what could you? What qualities do you need to do your job? You say? I find it really difficult to answer that because I think anything I say, I'm sure there are examples of people who've done it brilliantly that are totally different. I think the you, I would say um, tenacity. Um, and uh, and a kind of like it's a you know ultimately to, to basic thing is like a feel for story like a feel for it. Um, you can be people can be very bad communicators to still make amazing films. Um, there the world is full of them. People can be um, you know and as odd as two left feet like uh, you know. Uh, really extraordinarily, but the thing they all have is they they have a they they have they they kind of have a hold on the thing, you know. If you have that hold, you then need you have the thing that that entire machine needs to make something that works, and 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 you can find your own dysfunctional, odd, um, difficult ways of communicating that. But if you you know if you have it, it you have a fighting chance. I think that and tenacity. Like you really have to be sort of, you have to have that that kind of drive that you'll you know to get things made and done and 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 to do you know, but again some of the most introverted and disaster like just people who are so kind of and yet if they have the hold on the thing and the desire then it's possible. Sure, that's great. Thanks a million. And the last question, I think this one is probably even uh, less likely to have a have an answer, but. Uh, could you describe a typical working day? Um, yeah, I'll describe a really ordinary working day. Um, I mean, okay, it depends whether you're in production or post. There's three phases. Sure. But in really crude terms, development, production, and post. Um, development days, they vary. So there'll be, like for me it, at the moment, it's, I try to build time for just thinking and, and pondering and reading and, and that sort of brain work. And then there'll be Zooms, you know, at the moment or would in, in the back in the in the real world, it would be, you know, castings, conversations, um, meetings with producers, meetings with heads of departments as you're leading up to a project. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's development, it's either reading scripts and um, that have come back in, doing work on them myself, myself, having conversations with producers or writers or just thinking myself. And um, in production, 
the average day is get up really usually really early go go um i'd have i i'd have prepped the night before having a million times over thought about that section of the film but i'd have thought the night before i'll have notes in my head i'll probably have scribbled stuff down i'll have a script with lots of notes on it for myself which i may or may not look at but i like to know that i've sort of noted down some of the details and thoughts that i've had about it or sh pictures and whatever go in sit with the dp usually and possibly the dp and the first ad over breakfast and talk through the day um go go on to set and do the work and that work is like bring the bring the actors in first with just just the dp the the first ad and maybe uh continuity and sit there and run it and talk and plan it and just and discuss all the things we've talked about before and see if they really stack up and then start shooting and do that all day um have a few meetings at the end of the day go home prep the next day and go to sleep that's that's that and that can go on for like in the case of what i'm about to start uh, that'll be like 13 weeks wow. of that it's a lot and you're absolutely knackered at the end of it weekend spent prepping the week ahead wow so you gotta yeah, have and to then collapse for a month afterwards yeah. and then start out <laughs> Oh, well, listen, thanks so much, Lenny. That has been really, really great. No, I really I enjoyed that content. Couldn't, um, I couldn't get to, but it's, I think the students are going to really, really find that so valuable. And uh, it's great. Pleasure. When, when, um, when the pandemic's over, I'll come down. You're very good. We'll, Not at all. Uh, great Look after yourselves. Yeah, yeah, we'll take you to Nocton's. And, uh... I, I drink in pints with a gang of people at the moment feels like the absolute pinnacle of all that's good. We'll get there. We'll get there. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks so much. See you later. Stay safe. Take care. Bye.